In this video, I'm going to discuss my life and experiences as a hedge fund trader and what I learned. Hi everyone, I'm Cody Cook. Welcome to the channel where I talk about trading, investing, and business concepts. So several years ago, I had an opportunity to go to work for a hedge fund. Now, this hedge fund was structured a little bit different than a lot of hedge funds. It was set up and managed as a proprietary trading firm. And what that means is, is the way they structured it is traders who would have proven track records would come on board and would be allow allocated a certain amount of capital from the firm. And each trader was able to research and develop their own systems as they see fit. They did not have to share their systems with the firm. They could keep those entirely proprietary if they wanted to, which is one reason it's called a proprietary trading firm or prop firm for short. And so this allowed a large amount of basically research and development to go on all the time at this firm. It was very interesting and I learned a ton from this. So each trader was able to design and manage their own systems as they saw fit, as long as one stipulation, they didn't risk too much money, as long as they kind of follow those rules. And the second rule was, in this case, this firm specializes in day trading. So what happened is every trader was required by the rules of the firm to close out all positions at the end of the day. So this was a very different kind of environment that you might see in a lot of different cases. The reason the firm wanted to do day trading was that it significantly reduced risk, overnight risk as we call it, and it also significantly increased the amount of leverage the firm can use. And at that time, I don't remember exactly, but I believe intraday leverage was allowed to be somewhere five, six times to one. So they could have five to six times leverage. Overnight leverage at that time was two to one. So significant differences if they closed out their positions before the end of the day in terms of the amount of capital they could use. At the time, we had two offices. One was located in New York and the other was located in Texas. And our headquarters was in Texas, which was where I was located. In fact, the owner was also located there in Texas. And he spent most of his time actually on the trading floor with us. He had a desk that was actually just about seven seats down from me. And we would watch him trade every day. And he was very active in the floor, taking and entering and exiting trades throughout the day. And at the time, our top performing traders were also located in Texas. So I'll explain how the offices looked in Texas. Imagine several rows of workstation desks. Now these are really long desks that house several computers and their monitors on both sides of this desk. So we'd have these really long rows and at, there, at that time, I think we had four really long rows. We're talking maybe 50 yards long each. And they were just rows and rows. And each side of those rows were several traders, their computers, and somewhere between four to six monitors. So every trader had something like four to six monitors spread out in front of them that they would stare at. And we would be lined up shoulder to shoulder in these long rows. And at that time, the firm had something like 100 traders. The room was generally kept pretty dark with the exception of all the computer monitors lighting up the room. We had IT staff, we had floor managers, we had risk managers and so forth. And around the room, we had TVs that had CNBC up all the time. We couldn't really hear it. You could see CNBC in the background throughout the day. We also had access to a lot of fast news information, very fast connections, internet connections and news services that allowed us to figure out what was going on in any particular stock at any given time. When it was really busy, you could hear a lot of clicking on keyboards. Occasionally somebody would yell out information from the support staff or they would call out for information that they needed or call in a support staff if there was some kind of issue. Occasionally you'd hear a loud thump as somebody smashed their desk because they were losing money on a particular position. And when it wasn't busy, you would often hear traders just having conversations, laughing, kidding around, which you can imagine. At the time, it was almost all male traders. There were just a few female traders there. Research has actually shown female traders do very good on average they actually beat male traders in terms of overall returns on investment. Very interesting to say, but generally speaking, a lot of women are not drawn to the trading world for a wide variety of reasons I'm not entirely sure of. But in any case, at the firm, there were a few ladies who were trading at the time. Most of our days consisted of a very busy first hour of the day. We'd all get busy and things going on. And then a very quiet midday, occasionally something would happen in midday that we would have to make some kind of trade or make a move. And at the end of the day, the last hour or so, we were also very busy. Now, how the firm selected their people. In my case, I had started trading and investing for myself in college. So I had a, developed a little bit of a decent record, track record, and so I applied to the firm and they, they were willing to take a risk on me and brought me on board. Now, the interesting thing about this way this firm was structured is you only got paid if you actually made money for the firm. You were paid a percentage of profits you made for the firm. 
And of course, if you lost too much money, then you would be fired, such as the life of a prop trader. Now, the, the firm had a training program that they had put in place. And this training program was really good at teaching us how to enter and exit trades very efficiently, how to read the tape, how to find and seek large orders that were hidden in the market, because we could use those large orders as a way to take advantage of kind of a supply and demand imbalance, a temporary supply and demand imbalance. So the training was very helpful for teaching us how to maneuver through this very fast, high paced environment. We were assigned a mentor uh, who was a more experienced trader at the firm who also had a nice track record of success there. I think their idea was to hope that the best traders, some of their juju was rubbed off on us new traders and they kind of taught us the uh, taught us the ropes. Now, unfortunately, the biggest issue with the mentors is they weren't really compensated for guiding us and teaching us. Since we were really structured like a proprietary trading firm, it was a highly competitive environment. And unfortunately, a lot of these mentors knew all too well, and because they weren't compensated to train us or teach us, they knew all too well if they taught us too much and we began to adopt their systems, it was possible that their systems would not work as well simply because the more traders trading the same system, the usually the less profitable it is. And so a lot of our mentors were afraid that their own personal profits would significantly decline if they taught us a few things. So there was a very interesting mentor-mentee kind of environment. And so for this reason, some of our mentors would hold back information. It was evident that others were very good mentors. They would be open with everything, but some would actually withhold information simply out of fear that uh, their the systems they had learned and their methodologies would probably not work as well if more and more of us learn those things. Because of this extra motivation, the new traders would start to seek out all these new methodologies of making money in the markets. And so in a way that was a research and development division of the firm as we sought out new ways to make money. Now here I'm going to talk about what actually worked at the firm, what kind of strategies and philosophies actually worked at the firm. Now as normal, trading is most profitable when you have the most amount of volatility and movement. Okay, so we were constantly seeking volatility, constantly seeking movement. What stocks were moving around the most and all kinds of things related to that. Okay, so the systems that we successfully used at the hedge fund, now this changes over time. Hedge funds and prop trading firms, the systems that work vary over time. Systems can work for a number of years and then stop working for a wide variety of reasons. Could be regulation changes, could be too many people learn the system and it stopped working. The market conditions change. There's a whole variety of reasons that systems stop working or continue working and back and forth. But at the time I was there, our most profitable system by far was imbalance trades. Now, what is an imbalance? In this case, it was opening and closing imbalance trades. Now, what you would have at the, every, the end of every day or the beginning of every day, we would get a report, in this case, uh, sometime before the market either opened or closed. And what they were doing is they were trying to let us know that they had a particular imbalance. These imbalance reports would show us imbalances in particular stocks. So you might see, for example, XYZ stock may have a huge amount of buy on close orders compared to sell on close orders in this particular XYZ stock. Well, what would have to happen is the brokerage firm doesn't want to close out the day with this large imbalance. The reason they don't want to is that means they would have to sweep the after hours market significantly, in this case, upward in order to match up all the buy orders with enough sell orders. So naturally, they didn't want to do that because it would make their customers mad. So what they would do by sending these reports out to everybody, they would let us know that, hey, if you've got a large amount of this particular stock you might be interested in selling to us, here's a lot of buy orders, okay? And you might be able to balance this out. So what we would do to take advantage of this imbalance is before the market closed, we would go into the market and acquire many shares of the stock. We would start buying the shares of the stock. And before the close, we would put in our own sell on close orders. And in a way, we're helping basically fix this imbalance. Now, our way of thinking was, because we saw this large amount of buy orders out there, we knew that if we accumulated enough sell on orders, but it didn't completely take up the gap, there was a better than random chance that the price would print, the closing price would print significantly higher and our sell orders would make a nice profit over the prices we bought the shares at. So these imbalance trades occurred virtually every day. There would be an imbalance for the open and there'd be an imbalance for the close. And usually the imbalance for the open was kind of weak, but the imbalance for the close sometimes could be very strong. And there were certain times of the months that was incredibly strong, maybe like options, uh, when we had uh, options were expiring that Friday or something like that, you would see a significant amount of buy on close, sell on close orders. And you can often have some dramatic 
uh, imbalances in that. So what we would do is essentially, it was a type of supply and demand strategy or system that we would employ and that's how we used it. The imbalance trades were our best strategy overall. We made by far the most money on that, but there was a couple of occasions where they went badly. One day in particular, I remember, I don't remember the stock we were trading, but there was a strong imbalance. It looked very profitable to us. A lot of traders in the firm took this trade, but the print, I guess everybody piled into this stock in the wrong direction. It actually flipped the imbalance the other way. And we had a really bad print against us in the firm. In that case, I think we lost something like $3 million in about 30 minutes across the firm. Pretty rough day for the group. Unfortunately, some traders didn't make the cut up. They, they didn't survive. They they dug such a deep hole, it was gonna take them too long to make their money back. They, they weren't gonna be able to continue making a living at that firm. So it was a pretty devastating day but what was interesting about it is our best strategy occasionally could go really badly but overall we made many millions of dollars at the firm using that strategy now the next were IPOs or initial public offerings now our firm happened to make a lot of money off of these occasionally now the thing was is they didn't happen all the time but we'd pick our spots carefully and for that reason we could often make good profits in the IPO trades that we had and the advantage of an IPO is that often it comes very hyped up there's a lot of energy about it there's a lot of talk a lot of people are excited about it and you can have a significant and that's the purpose of an IPO the stock exchange is motivated to do this the, the investment banks are motivated to really push an IPO hopefully in their case they have a large amount of demand at the fund what we would do is we would buy it as soon as the IPO began to print on the market and essentially we used a type of trend following strategy where we would just kind of ride that until it started to turn over it started to show some signs that it was basically done running and we would get out of the trade and in one case we made a lot of money when Alibaba for example went IPO several Several years ago. Uh, that day was one of the most profitable days for the firm. We made several million dollars on that single day because most of the traders were involved in that trade. Now we don't trade all IPOs. There's just not a lot of energy behind them. You don't see a lot of push. They're too small. A lot of people are ignoring them. But generally speaking, IPOs were something that we did really well with. So another strategy that worked pretty well for us was price spikes and price crashes intraday. Now what we had at the firm was a lot of very advanced scanning software that was super fast and would scan the market for all kinds of movements and we could code it to look for different things. And many of us had special scans on at all times that would show us when a price of a particular stock would crash dramatically by more than a certain amount or spike up dramatically in a very short period of time. And then we would check very quickly our news feed to see if anything particular had happened with that stock, if we should avoid it or not. And the reason we did this is that more times than not, these stocks would start moving for reasons that weren't ever really explained to us. These prices would move very dramatically and it could have been a number of many reasons. Maybe somebody fat fingered an order. They put too many zeros on the quantity of shares they wanted to buy or sell. It could be maybe an HFT firm, high frequency trading firm. Maybe their algorithm glitched out. It could be some bogus news event. Sometimes you would see pump and dump schemes would form in the middle of the day, which is very unusual. Somebody gets some kind of rumor would go on. Never really sure all the time what had happened. Occasionally there would be a legitimate news story. Something blew up in the world, some kind of chaos. But generally speaking, a lot of these significant price spikes or price crashes would occur for not really a whole lot of news. So what we would do in these scenarios is we would, what's called fading these moves. So if you have a significant crash, we would start buying on the way down. Or if we had a big spike up, we would start shorting these. So we were actually going against the temporary trend. We were essentially trading a type of mean reversion strategy in which the idea was these prices would revert back to some sort of mean. Now this actually worked pretty well for the firm. We actually had an opportunity to do these just about every day, one or two of these a day. The issue we had was that at the time, and I'm, I have no reason to believe it's changed, I haven't kept up with it lately, but the exchanges, the stock exchanges, would have these kill switches in place that if the price moved too far too fast in a certain period of time, they were basically trying to avoid flash crashes, then they would negate all trades and essentially do a do-over kind of trade, which was very frustrating to us. That means we would have to literally give back all the profits we would make sometimes, which was incredibly frustrating for us. And so that is unfortunately the nature of the game. Exchanges do that sometimes. Um, unfortunately, a lot of laws and regulations are also involved and part of the reason these exchanges don't work as well as they would have. Uh, what happens is these the exchanges are so automated these days and there's so much technology behind them that these flash crashes are possible and it can create a lot of chaos for a lot of people. So we at the firm were taking advantage of these flash crashes or flash spikes, but we weren't allowed to keep the profits from it. So in a way, it was one of our profitable strategies, one of our more profitable strategies 
strategies, but because we had to unfortunately get back some of our best wins, um, and it, it really just made us just a little bit of money overall. So in addition to all those strategies, every trader had their own strategies, and we would design our own, we would test and experiment. Some of our strategies worked very well, some of them didn't work very well. A buddy of mine who traded there with me, he was actually, he would sit at my left where we were at the fund, he was at the desk right next to me. He and I devised a strategy that actually worked pretty decently. It was very interesting the way it worked. We found price levels, large price levels. We had a way to figure out what price levels would have a large amount of orders. So there may be a large amount of buy orders or sell orders. The way we would do is we'd wait till the stock would move up and we would have, because our systems were so fast at executing trades, we would have a breakout, essentially a buy order. If the stock broke out, it was a stop order. If it broke a penny above this particular price level that we saw all these orders hiding at, or we knew there were a lot of orders hiding at, if it broke just one penny above that, we knew that price level broke. And in many cases, it would run up a little bit, several pennies. And that would give us an opportunity to essentially go long. And because our system was so fast in execution, we could actually get that price we were trying to get. It would move up several pennies and we would slowly sell it out over the next minute or so. And that actually made us a decent little bit of money. The biggest issue with it, with this particular strategy was it wasn't very scalable. So it worked and it worked well, but it was not nearly as scalable as I would have liked. We could not size up in it. Basically, once we got above a thousand shares, the system really broke down and didn't work so well because we were trying to buy too many shares as it broke, there just wasn't enough shares in the market. And so at that time, I don't know if that's the, still the case today, but I have a suspicion it still is. There were a lot of what I would call shadow orders hiding in the markets. And these are orders that appear to be there. And you could see them on our level two quotes, you could see all this stuff. But what would happen is if you put a large order in, let's say a market order. A market order would say that the, you tell the broker to just grab whatever shares are available. What you would see, and you could see it all the time because of what's known as latency arbitrage, these exchanges would be able to detect a large order coming to the market. And this is just in nanoseconds. I mean, blazingly fast. They could see an order, a large order coming in and all the other market order, all the other limit orders in the market, I should say, in the market would run from our orders. So we'd end up being sweeped and have a significant amount of slippage. This was very frustrating, and this was something that we had to learn how to manage while we were there. Now, sometimes that actually gave us an advantage. And I'll actually tell you a quick story. Wade, he and I were constantly working on stuff. Wade had an interesting idea one day. He decided to go find a lightly traded stock that had a rather wide bid ask spread. Okay, this is very wide bid ask spread. And I think at the time it was like 10 cents. And I don't remember which stock it was. And what he did is he set up a program on his keyboard and he was able to hit a button and he could throw in a single share bid or a single share ask one penny below the ask or one penny above the prevailing bid. What was interesting about this, we did this as a kind of an experiment, he did it in particular, is he started off with this stock, and I remember this day like it was yesterday, he started blasting in tons of one share bids, one penny above the current bid price. Then he would instantly withdraw those. So what he was doing is he'd flash a one share bid, one penny above the prevailing bid, and then withdraw it in a matter of a second, half a second. I mean, we're talking nanoseconds, really. And so it flashed tons of these bids. Well, because the exchangers are so automated, the computers would detect this and they would up their bid. And then he would move his shares, he would just keep it going. It'd be one penny above the current bid. And as it as he did this, it just kept flashing. The bids kept rising to our amazement. It just kept rising. He moved the stock in a matter of about 15 minutes, an entire, if I remember correctly, something like a dollar or a dollar fifty per share. And this was like a $20 stock. Okay. This was again, it was a lightly traded stock, but to our absolute amazement, this stock moved very fast. What was interesting is that as it rose, we eventually, he eventually hit it. Uh, he got it to the point that the stock's bid ask spread got to a point where you could, there was a large amount of hidden ask orders in the market. You know they were there because the, you could just tell as the bid, the bid ask started to tighten as it got to these large orders. And then all of a sudden his one share orders started getting filled very, very quickly. And we realized there was a large order hiding there. You couldn't see it on the level twos. You couldn't see it in any other way. You couldn't see it on the tape. There was no evidence that the thing was there. There weren't a lot of shares being traded in any other way, but this one share little thing moved this entire stock like that. That was crazy. Next, he turned it and flipped it around. He decided to start lowering the bid by a penny. 
So he flipped the whole thing, one share below the prevailing bid, he began to blast in one share. Pull it, pushed it in, he would blast in an order and then pull the order, blast the next order and pull the order over and over again, super fast, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these in a matter of seconds. What would happen is the ask started to fall, which brought the bid down. And to our amazement, we watched the stock go right back down to where we had started. Very few other trades were occurring at this time. We were actually, he in particular, was moving the stock up and down rather quickly to our amazement. Now that really taught me a lot about how the market's working at that time. I'll talk about that in some other video, but that was very interesting to us. Now what ended up happening is Wade actually got in trouble. Uh, the exchange called the hedge fund and said, hey, we see this going on. You're not allowed to do this. And Wade unfortunately was banned from trading for one full day. That was his punishment. And so we didn't do that anymore. But what was interesting to me is that a one share order somehow broke the stock exchange, at least in this case. The the reason that happened wasn't because the stock exchange is crazy or it, it was partially because of the way the algorithms work, but it was mostly because, in my opinion, the large amount of laws and regulations that required exchanges to do things that really didn't make sense in the true proper execution of trades, share trades, share exchanges. I won't go into all of those details, but I'll just say the rules and regulations that had come in at that time had really, in a way, broken the market. That's why you would see these, at that time, you'd see a lot of these bizarre, crazy flash crashes that would happen quite regularly, is because these regulations were in place that allowed this bizarre latency arbitrage. It did not allow the, the natural free flow of capital through these exchanges. So it created that very unusual scenario. Now I'm going to talk about the profits of the firm. Now, people ask me all the time, how much money did the firm make? You guys must have made millions and millions of dollars, you know, all this stuff. Yes, the firm as a whole made a million, millions of dollars every year. And again, there were 100 traders there. But on average, the firm made right at one penny per share it traded was its profit, okay? So we're talking one penny per share, very tiny, tiny profit margins. And so this made it execution and managing the bid ask spread on every one of your trades super important. Many, many people may not, may or may not know this, but most bid ask spreads are a penny, two, three, four, five pennies wide. If you buy on the ask and sell on the bid, and let's say it's a five penny bid ask spread, then you've lost five pennies a share, just to put things in perspective. So we had to learn how to buy on the bid as much as possible and sell on the ask as much as possible and either make the bid ask spread as much as possible or at least neutralize the bid ask spread. And the way you neutralize the bid ask spread is you might buy on the bid, but when you exit, you exit on the bid also. So that's a form of neutralizing that bid ask spread. But generally speaking, the firm's profits were very tiny. A penny per share is not very much. We're talking millions and millions of shares, many, many millions, at least 100 million shares had to be traded just for the firm to make a million dollars in profit, just to put it in perspective. So we were really trading billions of dollars a year in equity. It was a wild environment to be at and I learned a ton from this. I calculated one time, I personally traded something like $35 million a year in stock. In this section, I wanna talk about what I learned trading for this hedge fund. It was a great experience. I learned a ton and to this day, I still learn, use a lot of the things I learned there. The first thing I learned was how to design and test my own systems. And I also began to realize trading and investing are really just two sides of the same coin. So it was very fascinating to do that. I really learned position sizing strategies there and the importance of them. I learned the enormous importance of exit strategies, what they can and can't do for you. The second thing I also learned is that day trading is not nearly as active as is commonly believed by most people. And the third is I learned how to retape and deal flow. Fourth is I learned how to execute trades effectively to neutralize the bid ask spread or at least profit off of the bid ask spread as much as possible. The fifth thing I learned, and this was quite surprising to me, is sometimes the best traders do not really know why they're successful. In other words, because they don't really know why they're successful, maybe it's a little bit of luck or, or whatnot, but somehow they have figured out a way to make money, but they're not able to actually communicate to somebody else exactly what they do. It's almost an incredibly intuitive process for some of these people. And that was fascinating to see. I'm not sure if the skills that they have for trading or investing doesn't somehow connect to their communication part of their brain. I'm not sure what's going on, but for some reason they just, they don't really understand why they're successful. It was very fascinating for me to observe that at the hedge fund. The sixth thing I learned was that great traders do not necessarily make great coaches or mentors. Being a trader and a trading coach are completely different occupations and being good at one thing does not necessarily make you good at the other. I was to discover there, which was also very fascinating. Next thing I learned was that hedge funds are 
are just like any other business. They're basically a pool of capital with people and systems in place seeking to make profit. They really aren't any kind of fancy thing. I know they, they've got a lot of myth and legend about them, but the simple fact is they're really just a pool of capital looking to make money in a wide variety of assets that they are able to buy and sell regularly. The next thing I learned was that a lot of hedge funds, although they're sophisticated, do not really have any better of a crystal ball than anybody else. The reason they're able to make money off is off of the probabilities. They know that they have a set of rules that they've tested or experimented with or have a lot of experience with that they know over time, if we follow the rules properly, we will have a positive expectancy or what's called an edge in the market. On average, we should make money with something. So that was a very interesting insight as well. The next thing I realized is I didn't really enjoy day trading. Day trading, although very active sometimes, can actually be quite boring. You can spend most of your days sitting, waiting for something to happen, which was very common there. Now, guys would sometimes watch movies, they'd play video games, other guys would research things to try to improve their skills. I spent a lot of time researching in my downtime. And we'd basically sit at our desks waiting, but it was large, dark room, Really didn't want to go outside and get some sun, mostly because you didn't want to miss the opportunity that might show up in any time, but sometimes you would go, again, hours and hours and nothing would happen. So I found that I began to develop a much different way to trade the markets that I enjoyed much more my personal personality and the fact that I actually wanted to be, a, be able to get up and get away from the computer on a regular basis and go do other things, research other things, work on other projects. So eventually, of course, I did leave the fund. I had a great experience there, but before I'd actually gone to the fund to trade there, I had started a business and that business had started to grow well and it was doing well and I had an opportunity to leave the fund and go focus full time on growing and managing this business which I decided to do and it turned out to be a very fortuitous decision and it turned out to be one of the best things that could have happened to me and for many positive reasons. All right so as of this recording I've been trading and investing for about 25 years. I've learned a ton, had a lot of coaches and mentors and today I do things very differently than I did than I did at the hedge fund. I traded a basket of 10 highly uncorrelated systems. I've designed a process, automated some scanners, and delegated part of the work I've hired an analyst who works for me. He helps me find opportunities, and every day I enter in the orders that we see in the markets as they come up. And so these systems kind of guide my actions. About half my systems are short systems, so they make money when the markets go down, and half are long systems, so they make money when the market goes up. So overall, I'm market neutral, and I've enjoyed some nice success with that. I trade only my own money now. I don't worry about tr trading anybody else's money anymore, at least at this time. Maybe someday I'll get back into it, but as of this recording, I'm not interested in that. I design the algorithms and these systems based upon my own experiences. Sometimes I learn some of these systems from other people, but overall, and I test them, in many cases, they're they're very well back tested and they have a lot of evidence they work in the past. In all told, I spend about 15 to 20 minutes a day entering my orders, then I can get up from my computer and I can go work on other things. In this case, I own and manage two companies, it keeps me very busy. I have employees that I have to manage, so that keeps me busy as well. So I don't really have time to sit at the computer and day trade all day. So the methodology I've employed where I can trade basically end of day data, I enter into my orders every single day, allows me a lot of freedom and I have found it is as profitable as any day trading I was able to find before. Okay, everybody, that's it for me today. If you guys found this video interesting, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, please reach out or leave in the comments. And thank you for watching.